Dallas Theological Seminary's Chapel Podcast. There is a classic picture that has been out on the internet for quite a while. It is that uh, underwater and above water combination picture of what an iceberg looks like. Uh, the 10% to 15% of visibility above the water is uh, there because of the uh, uh, flotation and the uh, uh, base of that iceberg that's under the water. Uh, our Spiritual Life Week is designed to address especially those issues that are below the surface. Uh, it's usually those that will uh, enhance or uh, detract or possibly even cost a ministry. And so it's been uh, the desire of uh, our school uh, for many, many years to continue to address uh, the unseen life uh, that uh, most congregations won't see, most families may not see, but it makes all the difference in a family, a congregation, or a relationship within the community. Uh, Dr. Townsend has been our speaker this week addressing such issues of character. Uh, we have uh, benefited great on that emphasis on grace. Yesterday, the emphasis on truth. Uh, John, thank you for spending the week with us, not only in chapel, but outside of chapel, uh, with our staff, with our faculty, with our students, uh, in private conversation. Uh, thank you for uh, giving us a week out of your schedule and your time to come minister to us out of the giftedness and the experience that God has given to you. Uh, would you join me in thanking Dr. John Townsend for uh, a week as he comes to us today. Thank you Thanks very much. It's been just a great big week to, for renewing relationships and meeting people and kind of remembering all the good that came and still comes from Dallas Seminary. So it's, thanks for being part of that. All righty. Um, remember, I'm a homework guy. How many of you did something toward your assignment yesterday of speaking the truth to someone in love? How many of you still married? <laughs> That's great. <laughs> you know, there's, there's a lot of research out there that says, um, learning research, that if you have an information, if you don't do something applicable within 30 days of that information, if you don't do something, some kind of an action step, you lose somewhere around 85% of it. So it's, uh, homework is just not a, uh, a cart with a horse thing. Ho homework has, is part of the horse. Just remember that um, we have, we're, we're beings that are knowing and relating and experiencing beings. And make sure you experience the truth as well as know it. So let me review a little bit. Um, as Dr. Bailey said, we're in the, in the end of a series in the Spiritual Life Conference on your character and the character of a leader and how to be a long-term leader who's going to run the race. And as the big theme for Dallas this year in spiritual growth has been to put the head and heart together um, to hopefully do that. And we define character Tuesday as very basically that set of capacities required to meet the demands of reality that you're going to have demands on you in the future. You have demands on you now. And you need the skills and the competencies within you, within your heart, to be able to pull off the demands on you. Then t Wednesday, we talked a little bit about the first of those capacities, and that was the ability to be, uh, experience grace, to give grace to others, to receive grace from God, and also to receive grace from others, and how hard that is sometimes, but how important that is. Then yesterday was about the truth that Dr. Bailey said, and that's about how we're to be people of the truth, to know the Word, to deliver the Word, and to pull, pull the Word into relationships, to set boundaries when we need to as long as those boundaries are in love in order to sustain our life and our, our ministries. So today we're going to talk about the third aspect, and that aspect has to do with kind of one of those things you don't always expect when you enter the ministry and it's called negative reality. That there are negative realities in all of our lives as we enter that, that phase called it's time to give back and time to find the mission. And yet it's something that's gonna happen. And I think that a, a way to, to understand that in an application way is I'm gonna do a little exercise with you guys. Um, I want you to turn to the person next to you 
And I want you to make a promise to that person because I'm a real big believer in promises and covenants and commitments. I want you to make a promise to that person, something you know you can live up to and something you know that you can say. I want you to turn to that person and say, if you get to know me well enough, I promise you, I will let you down. So turn to that person and say that right now. Get it over with. <laughs> See? And don't you feel lighter now? Like, okay, we got that out of the way. <laughs> now, why do you think we have to tell or affirm the reality of if you get to know me well enough, I will let you down. Because that's reality. You know, we live in a post-Genesis 3 world, and that's the bad news. And the good news is that we're moving toward a Revelation 22 world, but we don't know what that's going to be. So we have to live in the reality that there are negative things about us, failures, imperfections, sins, and negative things about other people, failures, imperfections, and sins. And somehow we've got to come to terms with how to deal with that successfully, especially as a leader. Um, that's why I want to kind of give you a skill set to deal with understanding this, because life has a problem, the universe has a problem, we have a problem, and that problem is called sin. And ever since it entered the world, it cracked the world, and it cracked relationships, and it cracked us inside. And as I used to learn here when I was in seminary, we're not as bad as we could be, but every part of us has some bad in it. And I found that to be true theologically in my own experience and, uh, and psychologically that every part of us has been tainted by sin. And because of that, we're going to pay a cost. See, there are people who can't deal with that reality, and we call them perfectionists. Now, I know none of you guys are perfectionists. <laughs> But be praying for those perfectionists in your life because they're going to really struggle. And a perfectionist is someone who, when they make a 94 on the test, instead of having a party about the 94, there's another number in their head. What number is in the perfectionist's head? It's called six. And they say great nurturant things to themselves like, you idiot. You knew that. Why didn't you study harder? And that lets you know there's some kind of a judge inside that's been there ever since Genesis 3. And if you don't come to terms with that tendency all of us have to be perfectionists and not learn how to live in an imperfect world as an imperfect person, you know what's going to happen is your ministry is going to suffer, and you're going to suffer, and your marriage is going to suffer, and your kids are going to suffer. I can tell you just from working with a, a, a bazillion pastors out there that those pastors that can't deal with the imperfections of life and pretend they're not there or are merciless to themselves in dealing with them, their life is hurt, their heart is hurt, they don't have a good outreach. It's hard to hang around a perfectionist. Whenever I have lunch with a perfectionist, I'm sort of uncomfortable because I know that if I say something about a problem, they either they're going to give me, try to fix me or ignore me. Perfectionists have a hard time dealing with reality. Some of my best sermons of when I'm at the church that we, my wife and I raised our kids at are when the pastor will say something like, glad to be here this morning. Let me tell you about the fight my wife and I had on the way here. And I just kind of relax. It's going to be an okay day. Because all of us are looking for someone who can identify with us and bring the hope of Christ and biblical realities, but they don't live the life, they don't leave, leave, leave the world of reality. When our kids were small, I was doing the, uh, we, we raised boys, and I was doing the uh, teach the kid how to catch the ball, father as pitcher thing that all of us are supposed to do. So Ricky was four, and so I gave him a little mitt that was as big as his head, and I stand over eight feet from him, and I said, now catch the ball, because we're going to go to play t-ball, and you need to learn how to catch this. So I threw the first ball at him, and he, he's four, and he holds his mitt up, and he looks at the ball as it comes toward him, and it hits the mitt, and it falls to the ground. He's a Townsend. That's what we do. <laughs> so I picked the ball up and I said, okay, let's try it again. Now close the mitt this time. And I threw it to him, he held it up, almost closed and it fell down. And then his own self-talk started. I'm an idiot, they'll never like me. Those kids aren't gonna accept me. And I said, um, maybe this is a discipleship moment here. I didn't say that, but I said, um, look, failure is learning. Every time you fail, you learn something. It's okay. We'll keep throwing it till you catch it. Failure is learning. 
So I figured that was a, a nugget that he would take the rest of his life. <laughs> so I get back, throw the ball at him again. He's got his glove up, closes it up. All of a sudden, the ball falls to the ground. And he looks at the ball and the glove and me, and he says, learned again. <laughs> well, that was the right attitude to have with our own failures, but it's one that sometimes we lose as we get older in life. And so I want to kind of address the problem of dealing with failure and, imper and imperfection, first off, theologically, and then we'll go into some practical steps. Because what happened in us, remember, I'm, I think we all ought to be studying more anthropology within our systematic. Anthropologically, when the fall happened, there's what I call the gap. The gap occurred inside you and me. And the gap is something inside us where there is the real me, the person that I really am, with hopes and dreams and loves and passions and a mission and competencies. There's the real me, or what we would call the real self. But then when the fall happened, there became another self, and we call that the ideal self. And the ideal self lives above the real self. And the ideal self is the person that I would like to be, want to be, desire to be. Man of God, woman of God, using my gifts, my skills, having a good time on God's Word, being a person who's whole. And yet I know I've got this real self here too who makes mistakes and can be selfish or broken or withdraw or not be the person that I'd like to be. And so all through my life, ever since the fall, you and I live in this gap of here's who I really am, the real self, and I know I'm not yet the ideal self, but I want to be. Paul talks about it in Philippians 3. He says, I haven't reached the mark yet, but I head towards it. I head towards it in the hope of Christ Jesus. But the gap is not a, pain, is not a pleasant place to live. I don't enjoy the gap. You don't enjoy the gap. We were not designed to have a gap. We were designed that the real me and the ideal me were supposed to come together, but it's not. I always know that I'm not yet what I should be. Now, let me tell you what we do with the gap, because the, the, the discomfort and the pain of living in that gap causes us to ad adapt some strategies to deal with it. The first one is we deny there's a gap. The real me is the ideal me, and I don't have problems. I'm the fourth member of the Trinity. Aren't you lucky to be around me? And when we deny the gap that I really don't have space between who I want to be and who I am, we can do that for a while, but I promise you, reality, as dictated by God, will crash into that. And reality will say, you're really not who you want to be. And we move out of denial through pain sometimes and through other failures and relational things. And God gives us suffering to say, denial's not going to work. So then we go to another strategy. After denial breaks down, we go into one of my favorites, which is work harder. And work harder means I'll just try to be a better person with my willpower and more diligence and more discipline, and I'll just kind of power my way into sanctification. Well, guess, there's, guess what one day of the year is the argument against willpower? There's one special day of the year that shows you willpower doesn't work. January 2nd, very good, because we all make these great New Year's resolutions. I make them too. But if you're a willpower person, you think, I'm losing those 20 pounds this year. This is it. And I'm never going to eat too many pizzas watching TV at night again. And I'm going to work out more, and I'm going to pray more, and on and on and on. And, you know, they've done a lot of research on New Year's resolutions. And guess what the average is in America on keeping a New Year's re resolution? It's, it's something around three weeks. So if you went four, you're sanctified. <laughs> because willpower will fail you. That's what the Bible teaches us. We, we have the law, and the law is good, but the law is a tutor to explain to us that we can never live under the law. So we deny it, the gap. And we willpower the gap. And that fails. So we go into phase three. Phase three is kind of painful. Phase three is when we judge ourselves. We judge ourselves. And we basically take the whip of the law 
and begin to strike ourselves with judgmental self-talk and statements. You should try harder. You're not really uh, a good Christian. You're not really serious about your faith. There you go again. You got a 94 on the test. You should have made six more. And those judgmental whip statements never win. It's funny when you do the research on people that have really seriously negative self-talk. When you look at this, what they call the, uh, the bell curves, People that are very hard on themselves like that and judgmental, their behavior does increase in performance over a short-term, temporary time. They do try harder, and they work harder because of how hard they are on themselves. But guess what it says in the long term? It'll always fail because judgment always fails. Sort of like you can whip the mule for a while, and he'll speed up, but sooner or later the mule will lie down in the road and say, I'll die. I can't keep doing it. So denial doesn't work. Working harder doesn't work. My self-judgment doesn't work. So then we go to another phase, and it's called despair. Despair. And despair says, I can't do it. I can't solve the gap. I don't like myself. I failed myself and my spouse and my God and my ministry in so many areas why try? I can't do it. Some of you are in despair today. You've been beating yourself up, living in negative realities, and the trying hard is not working, and you're sort of on the, why try? The funny thing is, despair is right next door to the grace of God. It's when people despair that they stop living under the law and begin experiencing that they live with a God who's already taken care of negative realities. That's why the passage for our talk today is one of the most profound ones that I think is ever written in the Bible. And, and Chaplain Brian mentioned it yesterday. Romans 8, chapter 1, say it with me, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because if you look at Romans 7, there is judgment. There is despair. There is trying harder. I do the things I don't want to do. I don't do the things I do that I should do. Who's going to save me from the body of this death? So in a really kind of a strange way, the despair, once you see the gap, is one of the best signs because what, you, what it means is despair then drives me to say, I can't. Help me. And God is waiting on the other side of the gap to say, I'm here. I've been waiting for you to go into despair so you don't look to yourself, so you look to me. So I thought what would be helpful would be to give you some skills as a present or future leader on how to live out that kind of no condemnation life in a world of imperfection, mine, yours, and the world's, because there are things you can do to deal with reality and live successfully with realities and yet, at the same time, know that it's more about God than it is about me. Here's the first one. Learn to double your gears. Double your gears. Now, that sounds strange, but I want to tell you, if, you, if you're your typical Dallas student, you have two gears in your head. One of them is perfection, and the other is absolute failure. And so, the 98 doesn't feel good. And what that creates is this horrible place in your head where if I do it all right, I'm fine. But if I don't do it all right, I'm an absolute loser. And one of the best skills you can learn is to double your gears from two gears to four. I'm going to give you the other two gears. I'm kind of a visual person, so I'm doing all this puppet language in my head. I hope you understand this. Is, is that there are two gears in between the two that I want you to add. So start with perfection as gear number one. We all would like that. Nothing wrong with that. Good goal. But the second gear is excellence. And excellence means I kind of knocked the top off of it. Not perfect, but I did really well. I'm, I think I'm proud of myself. I'm proud of the efforts, my church, my ministry, my marriage. It's excellent. That's a good gear to have. Then there's a third gear, and it's called good enough. And I live in good enough a lot. I'm very comfortable there. You know, I work with a lot of business types out there, and the economy the last two years when I said, how'd they go? They said, I didn't lose any money. It's good enough. 
So that's the good enough gear. And you need a good enough gear too. And now you've doubled your gears of your performance from I'd love to be perfect. And sometimes I am. I, I want to shoot for excellence. I've got to accept good enough. And there is a thing called failure. And that really gives you more of a reality base with yourself, your relationships, your ministry for, okay, now we can, we can live in the realities here. I remember when I was, um, when I was a, a, a third-year student. I, I went through school uh, through, through Dallas as a single person. Uh, not being mature enough to get married at the time. And God was preserving uh, me and my future wife. But I had all this admiration for the married people. I was like, I didn't see how they could pull it off. I knew how hard it was just for me. So I'm, I was in the library, in Moshe Library, and I was talking to a guy. He had four kids. There's probably a few of you out there. had four kids, a full-time job. He's taking 15 hours. And we're studying, and I, and I just, and you had to whisper in Moshe because we were everybody studying. I went to him, I said, Bill, how many kids do you have? He said, four. I said, I'm struggling and I'm single. He goes, I know. I said, how do you do this? He said, it's easy. I said, what's your secret? He said, I make really bad grades. <laughs> Here's the key. Here's the key. I felt like the heavens had opened up to me. But guess what? He's out there. He's got his THM. He's have a great, he has a great pastor. His kids are doing fine. He has four gears in his head. <laughs> and sometime in some classes, there was that, boy, I'm glad I'm not in the failure mode. I'll take good enough today. And he did fine. So that's your first skill. Give yourself a couple more gears. Here's the second one. It's learn to live in forgiveness. Learn to live in forgiveness. The greatest gift of God, the crown jewel of the theology that we believe in is forgiveness. That was creation, there was fall, there's redemption. It's about forgiveness. And learn to live where you're constantly making normal, I'm canceling the debt toward others and I want the debt canceled toward me. Get the debts out of your life. Get the debts out of your head and swim in the ocean of forgiveness. It's the best place to be. I was working with a, uh, a church, and they, they said, can you counsel um, one of our pastors? He had a, a pretty serious moral failure. It was a tough thing. But his wife was going to stay with him, and she wanted him, and he's a very talented guy, and he would fully repented. And they said, we believe in this guy. We want to take him through a period of restoration and bring him back, but can you shepherd that process? So I took him on and worked with him, and he did great work, faced all the demons inside himself, was you know, accountable to God and other people, fully repentant and healing and growing in really wonderful ways. And I was really proud of his work because it was a tough thing. He almost lost everything. Almost, everything almost went off the cliff, but he, he turned around. So from time to time, the, the elder board would call me in to make reports. And finally, it was the day that he could be fully restored. And it was time to say, it's all over. You're qualified for ministry. Your wife and you are in great shape, and you're ready to lead again. And it was an exciting time for him and for me. So we showed up, and they just asked particular questions to make sure if he's qualified. It was a good process. Restoration is a really good process. And we got to one point, and it was looking good. They, you know, he'd, here's the issues. Here's what had drove him to the sin. Here's what he was responsible for. Here's what he'd done to change on a deep level, on a behavioral level. He'd done all the work. There was one guy business guy who was a little on the non-forgiveness end of life kind of you got anybody in your life who sort of keeps score all the time and that was him you know the kind of person when you when you make a mistake they say yeah I remember you know in 86 at 3 o'clock in the afternoon when you did that too that kind of guy and he asked a question and something snapped in me when he asked the question I'll never forget it. it's like it was yesterday he said he looked at me and he said, can you guarantee me that this man will never do that again? And I'm sitting there and I felt something inside me, this incredible, actually it was anger. I felt this, <laughs> I, I did, I, I felt this kind of protectiveness toward 
this pastor because I'd been working with him so long and I knew he'd been through it all. And I felt really like this guy has no advocate here. He has no protector. And what are we going to say? And, you know, you can't say no. And I, and I, th I thought, how do you turn anger to something redemptive? <laughs> and I turned, and I don't, I don't know how this came out of my mouth, but I turned around to the elder and I said, can you guarantee me that you'll never do it? And the guy went, never mind. Because <laughs> he was a good guy. He understood. He just had that judgmental part pop out. And it was sort of end of story after that. What do you do? <laughs> you know? And I remember thinking, that was a lesson for all of us, that we need to be swimming in the ocean of forgiveness. At any moment, something could happen. You could make some choices. I could make some choices. And we need to be very, very aware of that because there's a Satan out there and there's our own temptations, our own brokenness. But I must be constantly canceling the debt and I must be constantly begging for that debt to be canceled. That's how you live in a real world as an imperfect person with no condemnation. Third skill, and this is a tough one for, uh, for DTS folks. Learn to grieve and let go of things. Learn the skill of grieving and letting go of things that you can no longer keep. See, as leaders, we're sort of anti-grief. You know, grief means to feel sad about something and say goodbye to it. That opportunity went away or that window closed or that relationship's gone or I'm getting older now and I've got cellulite where I never dreamed I'd have cellulite. And these are all the losses of life and we need to let those things go. But our, as a leader, we can't do that. We're going to take the hill. We're going to go up the hill. We're going to take it over. There's an energy in it being a leader. And to tell a leader, I love the way you take the hill. By the way, learn to be sad. It's hard because there's an energy shift. I've got to stop. I've got to pray. I've got to ponder. I've got to say, that was hard about my parents or that was hard what happened in my church. But I'll tell you, grief will save your ministry. Learning to grieve and let go of the things that you need to let go of will save you. Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 17 is a very strange verse, but one of the most powerful ones I've ever found. It says, call the wailing women. Jeremiah says to, to the nation of Israel, it's time to bring in the wailing women. Now, you OT people, you probably know this. You know what a wailing woman was? There was a certain category. It was an industry of women who had been trained professionally, structurally, formally to lead the nation in grief when it went through hard times, when it went through suffering. And if you look at CNN or Fox and you see somebody in the Middle East, you know, beating their chest and having ashes, there was an active grief process. Isaiah says that we have a Savior who was well acquainted with grief because grief is healthy for you. It helps you to get rid of something you cannot keep so that you can take in what you cannot lose. To paraphrase Jim Elliott, you need to learn how to grieve well. I'll give an example in the leadership context. A um, person in ministry I know, um, his whole business was shifted over to another business because another company bought his ministry company. He'd been with his company 18 years, and he had a very good staff, loved what he did, had meaning for, it, for him, and then he's in this new arrangement that he didn't choose. And I said, how's the new job going? He says, horrible. It's horrible. I said, why? He said, I don't understand. He said, I've got a fine salary. I like my support staff. I like the mission. But I just show up and I'm kind of zoned out all the time. And I said, what do you think is going on? He said, I don't know. Because every time I tell people I'm not really productive, they say, well, get your act together. Try harder. And try harder is not working. So I said, well, what do you think is going on there? And he said, the more I've been thinking about it, on a Friday, I lost my job and I lost my team. On a Monday, I was at a new office and a new desk and a new task with some really nice people, but I had 48 hours to adjust to something that I'd been in 18 years doing. He said, is it possible that I didn't grieve? And I said, well, what'd you do over the weekend? He said, I packed, got the new address, got the new cards. Because leaders, when we have losses, you know what we do? We move on. Okay, that's behind me. Move on. And we never allow ourselves that space to say, this was hard. I really lost something here. And I said, did you allow yourself to feel sad? And it was one of those kind of strange moments. He said, no, but I'm starting to feel it now. 
because we gave ourselves enough reflective time. He thought, I love that staff. I love that mission. I love that office. I love that old chair I sat in. I love that. And I never had gave it the respect of saying goodbye to it. The function of grief is to let go of things that you can't keep so that God can give you things that you can never lose. It's funny when you um, look at the neurobiological research, it really backs up what God says about grief. They do a lot of studies at places like UCLA where they take in Desert Storm people and people from Afghanistan and Vietnam vets who have been traumatized, and they have a model of the brain which says your brain has experiences and your brain has a present part. You and I are hopefully in the present right now. But your brain also has a past. We call those memory banks. And you past experience or, or, or where we, something happened yesterday or 10 years ago, and I learned from it, and I changed from it, and there are good lessons, and memory banks are really good. I can think past and say, well, won't make that mistake again. Memory's good. People that have been traumatized, a bad accident, a medical problem, violence, emotional trauma, the traumatized person has no past. They live in the present all the time. They have flashbacks. They have memories they can't get rid of. Everything's in the present. And what they found out was that there are these neurobiological pathways, neural, kind of like a little freeway that goes from the past to the present, and it gets stuck because of the trauma. And what they found was that if a person would grieve and let somebody be close to them and open up about how hard it was and confess it, the Bible talks about confession and grief together the pathways opened up again and the traffic jam went away and the, pa the present experiences would go down into the memory banks and become a memory they could use. I love that because then God gets credit for a neurobiology that He created, which He often doesn't get. That's why you and I need to learn how to grieve. Don't move on next time. You can make a bad grade, if you've got a relationship problem, if there's a death, if there's a financial hardship, find someone who's warm and say, I have a negative reality, I've got a loss, I've got to grieve it because I have a Savior who is well acquainted with grief. It will clean out your head and your neurons. And then finally, bring your failure into safe relationships. Bring your failure into safe relationships. We're trained to hide our failures and talk about our successes. And let me kind of be honest right here. Sometimes at Dallas, I, I'm out there with a lot of people, talking to a lot of churches and a lot of people who, who, are, who work with people like us, and we have a strange reputation. You know what they think of us sometimes, of us in Dallas? They'll say, really smart, got their theology straight, know the Word, but pretty detached and arrogant. And I've been hearing that for a while. And, you know, I try to argue against it and say we're not all that way, but we do kind of have that reputation. So sometimes they'll give me a Dallas person and say, figure this out. And guess what I find? Is that it's not because we're arrogant to the core. It's because we have found that it's not safe out there. It's not safe to be open. It's not safe to be real. It's not safe to be authentic. So we hide in the Word, and we hide in the vertical, and we hide with our studies. And what I would like to do is to give you an invitation that there's a God and there are safe people that would welcome the real you that fails. And it's warm there, and there's sunlight there. And I remember finding people in my Dallas days, some of them are in this room, who were those people for me. And they made it so I didn't have to hide anymore. When you begin to own and bring into relationship those condemned parts of you, God created a system where the sunlight begins to melt things, and you respond, and you come to life. Don't let hiding affect your ministry and make give you a shallow time and a time where you don't last as long as you need to. Find the safe places and find the God that will move you into 
a life of redemption. It's what the world is dying for. It's what our church is for dying for. But if we don't experience it ourselves, we've really got nothing to say to them. You must experience this to have something to offer. That's been my experience. And I know so many people from Dallas now who have done that, and those people are changing the world. And you want to be part of that process. Okay. As Prof would say, that was way too convicting <laughs> for me and for all of us. Let me give you a homework assignment. Last homework assignment. Remember that passage we mentioned, Romans 8, 1? There is there now, therefore now no condemnation. Write it out in the next 24 hours. And leave a little space. And insert where it says there is no condemnation. Put, there is no condemnation for me in this area. And you fill in the blank. My marriage, my personal life, my devotional life, my health. There's no condemnation for me in blank for those who love Christ Jesus. And pray over that and ask God, make sure I experience what is true. There's a position of no condemnation. Help me experience the position. See, you and I, we've been sent out to a broken world. It's dark. There's a culture that's dark. We have a light. We have Jesus. We have the Word. We are equipped. But be a model of hope that moves beyond brokenness to a truly redeemed life of no condemnation. You will never, ever lose an audience, nor not have a ministry with that message. I promise you, they're looking for you. Well, just a final word, just kind of personally, is um, thanks for having me here. I, I can't tell you how much I want to challenge you to make the most of your time here. There will never be another time like this in your life. I, I can remember slogging it through the courses, but as every year has gone on, the relationships that were built and the training I got in the Word of God has been more and more valuable in my life and ministry. Make the most use of it. When you're here, you're here, and then it'll go away. So it's a precious time, and I would like for you to get all the, all the uh, gasoline octane you can because we are truly a blessed people to be in this setting. Let's pray. God, thank you that there is no condemnation. And thank you that you want to equip us and help us not to be afraid of reality, afraid of problems, afraid of failure, because you've given us answers that transcend all that. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Thank you.